you would be opening your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Before I begin, I know someone has thought this question. You sat there this morning hearing us talk about the online directory, and you're thinking to yourself, what about the pocket directories? Well, we still have those. The answer is yes. We were just talking about that. But as soon as we update it, as soon as we print it and pass it out, we'll have to add more names to it. So you'll write in we get to that point. But yes, just in case you're wondering, we are going to be doing the pocket directory still. Um, the online is good until the power goes out. You can't use your phone. You got your handy dandy directory to call and check on one another. So we're definitely going to do that. <clears throat> so this morning we began a lesson looking at the role of miracles. And we basically spent the time looking at biblically, biblical examples of what the Bible teaches about the role of miracles, signs, and wonders. And what we showed from the text this morning, from the Word of God, is that miracles were used to confirm God's message. Whether we're talking about His uh, message from Moses to the people, when they say, who sent you, how were they supposed to know that truly Jehovah had sent Moses? Well the signs and wonders that he would be doing. Confirmed his authority, Gideon the same thing, it confirmed God's message to him. Even the young prophet, com, prophet in confirming his warning and his prophecy against the altar there at Bethel with King um, Jeroboam, he used a miracle there given by God to support and to show the authenticity of that message. But then we talked about how Jesus himself the very miracles and signs that Jesus did were for the purpose of confirming the message that he was preaching. And I think what makes this so significant is that from our standpoint, what we know of the scriptures is that what we know because we study, Jesus was the son of God. We know about his death, we know about his burial, and about his resurrection. But the people of the first century, when this day of Pentecost, when this message was preached, there were people standing there who saw Jesus die on the cross 50 days earlier. They saw him as a man. They saw him bleed. They had heard his teaching. They had seen the miracles. And so the miracles that Jesus did was to confirm to the people there that yes, he was from the Father, and ultimately the message is that he was God. And then we looked at the same thing, ongoing miracles through the course of the first century were given to help confirm that what the people were hearing came from God, came from the, the Spirit of the Lord. And we looked at a couple examples there of that. But a time would come when there would no longer need any more confirmation of God's Word because it had already been confirmed. There would be a time where we would walk away from the time where if someone said, well, how do I know I should believe in God? That we would need to say, well, here, we've just healed the sick. Because his record contains all of the evidences of his power, his might, and his authority. And so that brings us up to tonight's lesson, where we continue this idea. And now what we find is that the Word of God itself challenges miracles of today. Individuals, I say of today. Go all the way back to after the first century. If you have any records in history of someone performing a miracle, proving that they were from God, it challenges that. All the way into this day and even in the future. And there are a lot of people who claim to do miracles. A lot of people say there are individuals who claim an angel spoke to them. Or that God brought them an additional revelation. You know, that you hear folks who say this and have said it for many, many years. And the problem that they face is the Word of God itself. When the Word of God speaks, it tells us that it is done speaking. Now what I mean by that is that it is all that we need. That there's no need for further revelations from our Heavenly Father. I want to go ahead and make a point and then we'll get on to the next chart and show what we're saying here. One of the most powerful points about Jesus' teachings was the confirmation, as we already said, through miracles. But here's what was interesting. Jesus would heal the blind. He would restore the ability to hear to the deaf. He would give the ability to speak 
to the mute. To the one who was lame, he could now walk. Even leprosy was cured. So what's significant of that? Those were the signs that the Messiah had come. They look in prophecy. The prophets foretold that this time would come. Now, in your lifetime, have you seen these same miracles? No. Will you? No. Why not? Because the Messiah has already come. The next time that we see something where the veil of reality is ripped open and we get to look into the heavenly side of things will be when the Lord comes again. There's no, we don't have to wait for where are the signs now of the next time he's coming. Because when that time comes, he's here. So why do we say that we only need the Bible and we don't need latter-day revelation or confirmation? Well, it's because we believe what Paul wrote. We turn over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes to Timothy in the course of this second letter. He makes a very simple statement. Talking about how, how, how Timothy, from the childhood, he had, had known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you him wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The Holy Scriptures. He said all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The idea of the Greek word there is literally God breathed. The message from the Lord has come from the Lord. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Not half complete, not complete only for the first century. And the people in the 19th and 20th century, they're going to need more revelation. No. The Word of God is there to make the man of God complete, mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Peter makes a very similar statement to this. Over in 2 Peter chapter 1, there in verse 3, you'll note here the following statement. 2 Peter chapter 1, there in verse 3, he talks about as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. One time in a Bible study, studying with someone who believed in latter-day revelations from the Lord. And I asked him about that. What about this verse right here? Peter says, as his divine power has given to us all things. When Peter wrote this, Peter fully believed that the divine power of God had given them all things that pertain to life and godliness. What about today? Peter thought it was all complete. He, this person said, well, it was for Peter's time. But our time is different. We need further information from God. If that's the case, then what Peter said was not true. What Peter wrote was not valid. But Peter was inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to believe Peter over the teachings of modern day individuals who would say something that is different than what the Word of God has to say. James uses the phrase perfect law of liberty. Not partly perfect, not somewhat perfect, but the perfect law of liberty. And that's what we look into when we study the word of the Lord. That's what we put our anchor in when we trust in the word of the Lord. That perfect, that complete law of liberty. His word has been completely revealed and his word has been completely delivered. Paul makes the point in Romans 1 verse 16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the rest of the world. He says a little bit differently. He says to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. But that's his point. To the Jew first and to the rest of the world. Throughout the course of time, the word of God is the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. There is no need for anything extra. There is no need for any additional thought. If there would have been, God would have already given it in the first century. Because why cheat? Think about the amount of time that's gone by from the first century to now. That's a long time. Not going to try to figure it up. 20 some odd years. 2200 some odd years. Think about all the people that God cheated. If truly 
there was more information to come in the 1800s. Think about everybody before that point. 400 A.D., 500 A.D., 600 A.D. Well, you don't quite have everything. The world's changing a little bit. Here in a little bit, we're going to give a little bit more information. Finally, 1800s, here comes some additional. It doesn't work that way. If it's complete for Peter, for Paul, for James, for the Christians of the first century, it was complete and is complete for us today and will continue to be so until the Lord comes again. Look over with me at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4, and let's begin reading there in verse 11. Let's read down through verse 13. The writer here makes the following thought. He says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Have you ever tried to cut something with a dull knife? You have. That's the biggest problem with a knife is once it gets dull. And that's the danger of a brand new knife that's been sharpened and then you buy it and you cut yourself right off the bat with it. The word of God will never dull. The word of God in its power will never lighten up. It will never lessen. It will never be incomplete. It is sharper than any two-edged any two-edged sword dividing asunder the soul and spirit. It lays open within our lives who we are, the righteousness, the sin, our need for all of these things are exposed by the word of God. We don't need anything extra. We don't need any latter revelation. We don't need anyone to come along and say, yeah, but an angel told me last night that God has changed his view on these points here or there. It doesn't work that way. Anything other than that, and we'll talk about this in a minute, makes the word of God, or what they're teaching, a perversion of that word. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through 25, that the word of God, it abides forever. The grass in the field will die. All the, the greenery you see, the flowers, and they, they die all. They die. But the word of God, it endures forever. Peter, he's the same one that said, by as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, Peter said this same word of the Lord will never fail, that it will always endure. Even when people are unwilling to listen. And that's where we really get into the challenge there. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And let's go to verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4. To verse, starting in verse 1. Paul instructs Timothy. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Let's put in there even the idea of someone claiming to have been spoken to by God or through an angel. They will believe them and listen to them. Someone who claims to be able to do miracles, they will listen to them and believe them. And the reason is real simple. He says, time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But instead, according to their own desires, they'll heap up for themselves teachers who will teach them what they want to hear. And there'll probably be some sort of majestic supposed evidence behind it, but it's all false. And how do you know whether it's false? Look for the true confirmation. They said, well, they, they said they did a miracle. But Jesus did a miracle. Well, it looked like they did a miracle. There was no question as to whether or not Jesus did miracles. Even the religious leaders said they couldn't deny the fact that he had, wonder, he had done wonderful things. 
we have to make certain that in, in any era, if you would, that we are not allowed, we don't allow ourselves to be amazed by the things that are done by others. Whatever, the, whatever it is they claim to have said, claim to have seen, claim to have done, we must not let anything lead us away from the word that God has already confirmed. And that's why I say that God's word challenges modern day miracles. And the way we challenge is by testing them. The passage that we used for the script reading earlier is from Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. There were essentially two tests, if you would, to determine whether or not a prophet was from God. Now, this is the first one right here. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. Notice what he says here that they were supposed to do when a prophet spoke something. How were they supposed to know? Because they faced the same problems as we did today, do today. There were prophets that would go and claim that they're speaking on behalf of God. Some of them might be speaking oracly, that is to say, speaking very, speaking as a well-spoken oracle. They would lead people away. Well, how are you supposed to be able to test them? If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. So here's what he says. He does something, and it comes true. He says, you know, it's going to rain cats and dogs. That's not what they would have said, but we say that. It was going to rain cats and dogs tomorrow. And it rains cats and dogs. You see, I told you now, let's go and worship these false gods. Because I've been given this message from those gods. And now you, because I have prophesied this and it happened, you now go with me. If that was to happen, and they say that, let us go after other gods, which you have not known. And let us serve them. He says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You know, many times we think about a test and this would be kind of the second test. If someone was to prophesy something was going to happen and it didn't happen, you know, they weren't sent by God. OK, that that's the easy one. But what about the thing, the situation where he manipulates things? Maybe he accurately foretell something that was going to happen naturally and then he tells you to do something contrary to the law of God what do you do well clearly he's from God he predicted that that tornado would come and it happened so he must be from God and God's telling us to worship false gods therefore there you go he says you don't listen to him he's telling you to do something that God has already forbade God has already stepped forward and said, you shall not do this. So even if he looks like he's a prophet of God, he's not. When the message he's delivered is not from God and contradicts God. Over in Matthew 7, there, he says, not everyone who says to me, around verse 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. There are many people who claim to call upon the Lord. Many people say, Lord, have we not done wonderful things in your name? Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not done all these great things? And he'll say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Just because someone appears to be acting on behalf of God does not mean that they are on behalf of God. They're only serving themselves and they're using the Bible as a way of getting people to follow them and to walk after them. It becomes a worship of men and not a worship of God. And that has happened too many times during the course of history since Jesus died upon the cross. Paul warned about this, the great apostasy, the falling away. Paul warned about these things that would happen. But real quick over in Acts chapter 19, beginning there in verse 13, here's a great example of this. Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Shiva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? 
Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. They may have claimed to be from God, but they were not. They may have claimed to have had the power of, of Jesus and the, the apostles, but they did not. If you want people to believe you, and you're going to teach something that is false, you need to be able to deceive them. Sometimes you might be a well enough spoke, I was going to say good enough, that's not a right. You may be an eloquent speaker and be able to lure people that way. But sometimes that doesn't catch anyone's attention. But when you claim to do a miracle, when you claim some sort of prophetic vision, and you wrap that up in a nice, neat package that appeals to what they want to hear, that's how you deceive people. Peter says these were the false teachers. You know, he talked about false prophets during the days of old, there in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. And sure enough, there were false prophets during the time period that we refer to as the Old Testament. And, and he references that. But he continues in this context, but there were also false, but there were also false prophets among the people, 2 Peter 2, verse 1, even as there will be false teachers among you who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. There are those who seek people to follow them. They want people to walk after them. There's some sort of validation they get when they can be the leader of peoples and people flock around them and basically worship them like an idol. And they will deceive. They will do any and everything they can to convince people not to follow the Lord, but to follow their message. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, 2 Thessalonians 2, there was this apostasy coming. And this is not a great revelation if you know mankind, and Paul did. He knew the Jewish leaders that he worked with. He knew the hearts and minds of the men that rejected the Christ. He knew that many of them sought power and they, and, and they hungered. This is why they were so jealous of Jesus. They hungered for that top position of religious leader and the masses to turn to them and follow them. So he knew that men like that would try to get people to follow after them. Apostasy was coming. It was inevitable, if you would, that there would be people who would hear the message of the Lord and try to make great gains off of it, who would try to get people to follow after them. I mean, it happened under the Old Testament, and it happened during the days of the apostles, and it continues to happen even up until this day. So what are we supposed to do? Well, John tells us in 1 John chapter 4, we're supposed to try or test the spirits. Notice with me, if you would, in 1 John chapter 3. Let's start in verse 24. One verse there, and then we'll read in chapter 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. But by this you know the Spirit of God. He says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. We have to weigh what we're hearing by the measure that is the Word of God. We have to take what is being taught, what people say, and measure it by the very words that God has breathed out. Is it what the Bible teaches? Is it what the Bible says? One side note of a passage that's not in the lesson this evening has to do with Paul's warning to the brethren in Galatia, in Galatians chapter one, beginning in verse six and going through verse nine, where he says, if we are an angel from heaven, teach to you any other doctrine than that which you have received from us, let him be a curse. And then he says it again. If anyone teaches anything other than what they, the apostles and the prophets 
Jesus Christ himself has taught, let him be accursed. Ephesians 2 tells us that the household of God is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And anything that is contrary, anyone that comes bringing a different gospel, which is not another, he says, but some would pervert the gospel of Christ. That's Galatians 1, 6 through 9, the text there. Don't listen to them. There are many religious groups and teachers who profess to possess gifts of the Holy Spirit. And many of them will use these things as a way of convincing people. I know a preacher who was converted out of a religious belief that strongly believed in miracles and healings. And they would have special, like we would have gospel meetings, they would have week long of healings and everything. And I'd heard different reports from other preachers who'd kind of go to those. There was uh, one report, you know how preachers go with stories, they hear it and then they tell it and it kind of expands and it morphs. But one preacher went to a healing in a wheelchair, legitimately crippled, and they didn't let him approach. He was not accepted as one who could go forward and be healed. He really believed that if God was there and if their, their healings were, were legitimate, he really believed he could walk away from that. But they didn't even give him the opportunity. So anyway, back to this preacher I knew. He had been in this religion, I think it was some 15 years. And I asked him one day, I said, how real were these healings? Because I'd like to know. You were there. You participated in them. You were a part of that group before he learned the truth that came out of it. I said, how real were they? And he knows his words were. He said, they were about as real as wrestling matches. If you've ever seen wrestling matches, man, they look amazing. Well, they are just a bunch of gymnasts who know how to fall properly. They weigh about three times more a gymnast would. It's fake. It's put on. The people who wrestle, they know how to fall. They know how to jump off a rope and, 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 and fall down. And it looks like they're, they're killing themselves. But they get up and go away, shake hands and... And, and go home until the next day they come back again. If you really thought that was real, I'm sorry, but that's, <laughs> that's the way that it is. And he said their healings were effectively that way. It was orchestrated. It was arranged. Sometimes people would get paid for their participation. But it never once healed someone who was sick because it wasn't possible. God was not and did not let that be done because the ages of confirmation were gone by. If your teaching, if your religious teaching cannot measure up to what the Bible teaches without the Bible being twisted and changed, then it's not from God. And we have to hold ourselves to the same standard. We have to always make certain that what we teach and believe is because the Bible teaches it. Not because we've been told that we have to believe it, but because we've sat down and we've studied it. And it takes time to do that. And we have to make certain that what John preaches from the pulpit is from the Word of God. And if it's not, you need to come talk to me. Come show me, sit down with me, and show me the error of my ways. This is our charge towards one another. Because we cannot afford to find ourselves in the position where we teach something that is contrary to what God has already given us. So, you want to know how to deal with the miracles of today? The answer is simple. Know the Word of God. Understand God's purpose for having you signs and wonders and miracles. Study your Bible every day. Sharpen your skills using that sword of the Spirit as Paul calls it in Ephesians 6 verse 17. And know how to rightly handle the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, that's our charge. Know how to handle the word of God and understand it and use it to teach others. To with love and gently study with them and show them the path. Help them walk through the path that will then see what the Bible actually teaches. And be ready to give an answer. When they ask you, why do you believe? Why don't you believe in miracles today? Why don't you believe in this and that? Be ready to give an answer to them. Here's the thing we need to make a point real quick. I do believe in miracles. I do. And I think you do too. 
Every miracle you read about in the Bible is not some fable that you've heard passed down through the centuries. But it was an actual event that took place here on this earth by those who were inspired by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus himself, by the prophets of old. These things happened. And those are the miracles that we believe in. The ones that confirmed the word of the Lord. Now, are there great and wonderful things, the providence of God, for which we are utterly and, and, and forever thankful to him? Absolutely. Do we pray to God? Yes, we let our request be made known unto him. But if you're falling off a cliff, I don't know if God will stop the law of gravity so you don't hit bottom. So don't fall off a cliff. I could be wrong about that. But based on what the scriptures teach, now we are waiting for the day that Christ will come again. We are waiting for the time when we will stand before the throne of God and be judged by him. And hopefully be like those who will hear the words, enter thou in, you good, enter in, you good and faithful servant. Because we trusted and relied upon his words, confirmed by his wonders and signs and miracles many, many years ago. So, for those who aren't Christians, how does this pertain to you? My, my encouragement would be, let's study together. Look at the miracles that is done, that are recorded for us in the scriptures. Look at them as being real events, because they are. And the very miracles that confirmed that the message came from God in the first century continue to confirm for us that the, the message came from God as well. And let that fact of the word of God convince you that Jesus Christ is the son of God and that you need to believe in him and turn to him, repenting of your sins, turning away from your sins, and be buried with Christ through baptism. So you'll rise up then to walk in a newness of life. Many examples of the book of Acts. Paul himself. Who believed these words. Because they had been confirmed by God. If you are a Christian. You've not been living faithfully. There are a lot of things going on in the world today. That can lead us away from the truth. If we listen to it. But if we like Peter. While he was looking at Christ. If we keep our focus on the word of God, then we're not going to sink. We will walk faithfully before him. But if you have fallen into weakness, it's time to repent and come back to the Lord this evening. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.